Make some noise, because I'm church family. Yeah. Shout out to everybody that is watching this service online or wherever you may be. We're so glad that you joined us today. We are in week number three. Somebody say week three. Week three. Of our series on the book of Habakkuk. That's right, the book of Habakkuk. And if you missed the first two weeks and you're watching online, just click right up in here. You can go back and watch both of those messages. But I'm also going to go ahead and give you just a quick review so that you kind of know where we've been at and where we're going today. So here's a quick, very quick re uh, review. Have you ever faced a difficult situation in your life? Raise your hand. Anybody ever been, had faced a difficult situation? And you knew God could do something about it. Oh, yeah. yeah. But it, he didn't yeah. do it when you needed him to. Anybody ever been there before? Oh, yeah. Pretty much every hand up in here. And it left you confused. Like, I prayed. God, what happened? You can relate to Habakkuk. And so here's who Habakkuk was. He was one of the prophets, the minor prophets in the Old Testament. It's one of the last books in the Old Testament. Minor prophet meaning he had a shorter book than the, than the major prophets. And unlike the other prophets, he didn't speak to the people for God. He spoke to God for the people. And he was saying, God had told him, I'm going to send a nation that's more evil than you to overwhelm you and destroy you. And Habakkuk is going, that's just not fair. I know we've wrong. I know we've sinned. I know we've done some wrong things. But why are you sending somebody that's worse than us? That doesn't seem fair. And you know what? We have all been here before. We've got we that God has done some uh, allowed some things to happen in our lives that doesn't seem fair. It's left us confused. It's left us wondering what is really going on. Also, during this whole series, we've been talking about this thing called. If you've been here the last few weeks, what is this called here? The dip. The dip. The dip and this whole message series has been inspired by Pastor Craig Rochelle. And this particular drawing here comes from an author named Seth Golden who wrote a book called The Dip. But we're going to use it a little bit differently than he did. So here's a quick review on The Dip. Everybody up in here starts down here at the bottom of The Dip. It's where you are far from God. You haven't given your life to Jesus. But one day you give your life to Jesus Christ and then all of a sudden everything starts going well in your life. You start praying God is answering those prayers. You go to Target. You go to Walmart. You get the spot that's right by the front door. Your favorite song comes on every time you get in the radio. When you come to church, it's like Pastor Will been in your house listening to you because the message is speaking directly to you. Everything is going well. Make sure we, uh, there we go. We good there? And then all of a sudden, one day, you pray. And what you ask God for doesn't happen. You get to Walmart. Or Sam's, and you way a country mile away from there. You show up to church, and what I'm preaching isn't hitting you like the old messages used to hit you, and you're wondering what is God going on? What's God doing? I prayed for somebody, it got worse, and you hit what Henry Black could be called a crisis of belief. Every single follower of Jesus Christ is going to hit this spot. Everyone. And what happens is, is when you hit this crisis of belief, you start going down here. And what happens is people do one of two things. They either try to go back and chase the spiritual high of when they first gave their life to Jesus, or they say, God's not real. I'm walking away from God. But what we've been talking about through the book of Habakkuk is taking the third option, which is a little bit more difficult. But if you will take this option, God will take you to new places. And that is going through the what? The dip. In week one, we talked about chapter one. Chapter one was that crisis of faith. Believe that wondering. You got questions. I thought God said that what I'm seeing and what I believe aren't lining up. That was chapter one. Chapter two, we talked about all about the dip. And that was about when you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting. And what do you do when you were in the dip? We learned last week that we stop and we listen. Then when God speaks to us, we write it down so we can document what God said. And then we wait and we wait and we wait and we wait. And situations and circumstances may not get better. Matter of fact, they probably will get worse. But, somebody say but. but. If you will stay with God, if you will continue to Habakkuk him, which his name means embrace and wrestle. If you will hold on to God, if you will wrestle with what's going on, and even though circumstances and situations don't seem to be changing, God will then begin to take you into what we're going to talk about today, and that is a chapter three title. 
type of faith. A chapter three type of faith. And it's beautiful. This chapter three type of faith can actually be found in James chapter one, verse two. And I don't have the scripture on the screen, but it says this. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Because why? When you're in the dip and you're facing those trials of many kinds, what you understand is what God is doing is that he is working perseverance into your life. He's bringing endurance into your life mm. so that if when you have those things, you will be mature and grow and you will lack nothing Amen. in your life. Mm. But you will never get to the place of lacking nothing until you go through the yeah. dip. This is the book of Habakkuk. And what we learn is that God will often use the dip to prove his faithfulness and bring you to a chapter three kind of faith. With all of that in mind, church, I'm going to put this down here because we're going to come back to it. Let's go to Habakkuk chapter three. You ready? Yes. Let's go. If you don't have your Bible with you, that's okay. We're going to have it up here on the screen for you. All right, let's go. Uh, chapter 3, Habakkuk chapter 3 We talk about embrace and to wrestle That's what his name means But we're going to continue to embrace and to wrestle Now let's go into chapter 3 verse 1 Check it out It says this This prayer was sung by the prophet Habakkuk I only wanted to show you this particular verse right here To show you how powerful worship and music is in our life The reason we start our services with worship Is because it gets our eyes off of our own situation and gets our eyes on God. So even Habakkuk shows us that, you know what? This prayer, I can't just pray it. I got to sing this thing. Because I need something to move me a little bit, okay? Now let's go to verse number two. Here's what it says. Here's Habakkuk. I have, he's talking to God. I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, Anybody got some deep needs in church today? Yes. I, I know we do. Yes. Help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember your mercy. What is he saying? God, I've heard everything that you've done. I know you've done some amazing things. I know you have. But I'm asking that today, you do for us today what I heard you did back in the day for some other people. Anybody been there before? Like, I heard God can do some miracles. I just haven't seen them. I want to see them. So that's what he's saying. He's like, God, I heard what you did, but I need you to do something today, God. Please, today. You've done these great things. And I know, but it doesn't seem like you're doing them right now. Can you please do something right now? Can you do it again? So I'll be saying that song in worship today. God, can you do it? Again, you've moved mountains, but can you move this one? Yeah. That's what Habakkuk is talking about. And so, what we're going to learn today and the question, because every week we've been, we've been focusing on different questions. Week one, we focused on what do we do when God doesn't seem fair? Last week we talked about what do you do when you were in the dip? Today, we are going to focus on this. How do you, by faith, climb out of the dip? Because many of us last week, we said we were, we're in that dip, but now it's time to come up. It's time to come out of the dip. All right, let's go there. Well, we learned in just that one verse of Habakkuk that there were three things. And throughout this chapter, we're going to learn throughout this chapter, there are three things that we must do to climb out of the dip. All right, the first thing that we have to do is remember. Somebody say remember. Remember. We remember. What do we remember? We remember God's character and his goodness. You got to remember who he is and that he is good. Because I know some of us, have, we grew up in church traditions that taught us that God wasn't good. That he was angry. That if you did anything wrong, boom, he was going to smite you. You better look out for some, a lightning bolt might hit you. So you, you, you grow up with this, with this mindset that God isn't good. That he's really just looking to get me. And that's not the case. God is a good God. He loves his children. He cares for us. He loved you so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die for your sins. So we have to look at that God is good. And so what Habakkuk is going to do is he's going to remember some actual tangible things. He's not just going to remember some ethereal, theoretical thing. He's going to remember some actual things that he can touch, feel, hear, listen, all of those different things. Okay? Because what I know about 
memory is that seeing something, hearing something, smelling something can trigger that memory. For instance, there was this perfume that Davina wore when we first started dating. And then when we started having kids, she couldn't wear it because, you know, you know, with around babies, you just can't wear some of that same stuff. But now that our kids are older, one day, she, I, I, met, I can't remember when this was, but she had went and got some more of that. And I, I remember smelling it, and it took me back. It took me all the way back to 2001 when I first met that girl. Saw so her in college and was like, okay, Lord, I see your creation out here. Your creation is good. I see you, Lord. You're a good guy. It took me back. When I smell chicken and dumplings, it automatically triggers my memory back to my, my kindergarten, my school. Because I don't know why they made chicken and dumplings every single week. And I didn't like chicken and dumplings. <laughs> I still don't like chicken and dumplings. So when I smell chicken and dumplings, I, 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 auto, I quickly go back to my school. And the little, the, the nun, the Catholic nun that was always on me, her name was Sister Rose. Sister Rose, I thought Sister Rose didn't like me. And I didn't like Sister Rose either. She was always on my case. But looking back though, as an adult, I understand why Sister Rose was always on my case. I wasn't the most compliant child at the time. I didn't, everybody, I was the only child in my class that never took a nap. We took naps back in the day. I don't know if they still do that in kindergarten, but in my kindergarten, we took a nap. I never did. I was always up. Sister Rose had to move me four times during the school year because I was always talking to kids. And they were like, I'm sleepy. I'm like, I'm not, let's talk. <laughs> so I look back and I go, Sister Rose, I'm sorry. She's probably in heaven with the Lord right now. But I'm sorry for all the grief I gave you, amen? But chicken and dumplings takes me back there. You may have that. There may be a certain song that if you heard that song, it, some of y'all, okay, hold up. I haven't even given you the demonstration yet. And I see some faces out here in the crowd going, Mm -hmm. I don't know what song came to your mind, but there are certain songs when you hear it, it'll take you back. It'll take you back. Some of y'all before Jesus, BC, before Christ, BC, you hear some of them songs. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, like do I need, maybe, I need to, maybe I need to move on. I'm going to move on. My wife told me to move on. I was going to go there. But like, if you hear that, doom, doom. Dun, 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 dun. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. For the 99, 2000. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. You don't know what that is? Don't move on. Remember, though. Remember. 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 Okay? Here's what Habakkuk does. He starts to jog his own memory. So here's what he does. Let's look at verse number, verse number three. He says this. I see God moving across the deserts from Edom. The Holy One coming from Mount Paran, his brilliant splendor fills the heavens, and the earth is filled with his praise. Now, we look at this and we go, um, I don't know where Edom is. I don't know where Paran, Mount Paran is. I don't understand that. But the people that were reading this or hearing him, they knew exactly where this was at. Right. That would be like if Habakkuk was alive today, he would be like, man, I remember the flood. That hit back in July of 2022 in St. Louis. Right? It, we would understand that. But somebody that lives in uh, uh, Minnesota may go, I wasn't there. I didn't see it. So for them, they knew. He was going back to think about all of the things that God did. And what he's explaining is he remembers when they were the stories that his parents and grandparents told them when they were in slavery in Egypt. And God brought them out into the desert. And God would show up for them at Mount Paran. And God would do miracles among them. He was going back in his memory, remembering these are the things that I've heard that God did. He brought us out when we were enslaved for over 400 years. He brought us through a desert when there was no food in the desert. And every single day, God would provide food for us in the desert. You can find everything I'm talking about in the book of Exodus, second book in the Bible. He was remembering all of these miracles that were going on in his life. Why? Because the memory, remembering what God has done will help you get through when you were in the dip. Mm -hmm. I remember, God, you brought me through this. I remember this. Listen to verse uh, 4 through 6 real quick. 4 through 6. His coming is as brilliant as the sunrise. 
of light, a light flash from his hand, where his awesome power is hidden. Pestilence marches before him. Plague follows close behind him. When he stops, the earth shakes. He's talking about God. God is so powerful. When he looks, the nations tremble. That he shatters the everlasting mountains and levels the eternal hills. He is the eternal one. He's like, God, you are so big. Like, I can't even, I can't compare. Like, if you look, mountains will crumble into, into dust. He's remembering who God is. And he's remembering what God has done, but he's also remembering who he is. This is what we have to do. When you are in the dip, you've got to remember. If you look at verses 7 through 15, I don't have them on the screen, but he continues to remember some tangible things. In your own life, when you are in the dip, you sometimes you have to remember. Yes, Lord. I remember. Yes, Lord. I've shared this so many times. I remember praying with my mom as a little kid. I remember praying that God would do something in our family's life. And God did it. Amen. He delivered my father. I remember my parents saying, we're going to start this church. And I remember going, oh, in our house, how are we going to do all of this? And now, 30 years later, the church is still here. I remember Amen. that first service. I remember when God pulled me out of my own addictions. Amen. When I was addicted to pornography. I remember when God snatched me out of that. And now I'm years free from it. Amen? Amen. I go back and I remember. I remember God healing my wife. I remember God healing my children. I remember seeing God do some amazing things even in your own lives. Hearing the testimonies of healing, of, of provision. When, when you didn't know how the God was. I remember those things. I remember these great moments that God did these miraculous things. Like, I'm going to share just real, real quick. This just happened, y'all. I got to share this because it's good. This just happened this week. So our computer that we use for the church to, to basically control all the service, it went out last month. It went out. So I'm like, how are we going to do service? For one week, we use my, my laptop. I had to go buy another one. I'm like, what is going on here? I take it in to get it fixed. They're like, okay, we're going to try to get it fixed. One place tried to fix it. They couldn't do it. So I take it to Apple. They can't fix it. They tried three separate times. We're gonna fix we're gonna, we got it, we got it, Mr. Coleman. Uh, we don't, we're gonna try it again. Up, uh, we don't, we're gonna try it again. Every time, it wouldn't work. And I'm like, this is just, I'm gonna have to buy another computer for the church. And y'all know these things are not cheap at all. Like these things are over two thousand dollars. I'm like, oh, oh Lord, this is how we gonna do this, Lord. And they called me, said, Well, Mr. Coleman, um, actually, here's what we're gonna do. We're going to give you a brand new computer Amen. and we're going to charge you the amount for the repairs. Amen. $600. Amen. Which is cheaper yeah. than buying a new one. That's right. Okay? We're not done now. So I'm going to pick it up. This is Thursday. We walk into Apple. I'm thinking I'm just going to walk in there with my kid, get the computer, pay the money, and walk out. We're there over an hour and I'm like, what is going on? They come out and they say, uh, Mr. Coleman, did we quote you uh, $4.99 plus tax? Yes, sir. Well, um, actually, I think it's going to be $333. That's what the system says. Is that okay? Uh, what you want me to say? No? Yes. That is okay. So they try to do scan it, and they're like, something's not right. So they leave out. I'm waiting another 10 minutes. I'm like, what? Is, I'm getting frustrated now. I don't understand what's going on. I'm confused. You can kind of say I'm kind of in a dip. What are you doing, God? I need to. I got places to go. They come back out, and he, the guy goes, Okay, we figured out what happened, Mr. Coleman. What's going on? Well, apparently, we owe you money. And you have a credit. Am I getting pumped? What's, what's going on here? What, what, what are you at? How, how did I get a credit? We thought you, did you overpay for something? I know. I paid everything off? No. Well, you actually have a credit. And we owe you $162 that you have, you, but it goes away if you leave. So you have to use the other $162 to purchase something else to go with your with the computer. What? So we go over, I get a hard drive, because I learned my lesson not having a hard drive with the last computer, lost everything that was for the church. So now I got a hard drive, and they were like, you still got $18 left. Okay, give me that charge, that phone charger. All right, Mr. Coleman, you owe us $2.11. <laughs> You telling me uh, this would cost me twenty five hundred dollars full price, and I only got to pay two dollars and eleven cents? I'll take it. So I got out of there as quickly as I could. In case they were like, "Are oh, you the wrong, Mr. Coleman?" But but I share that with you 
Because now, down the line, I'm going to remember that. I didn't, I didn't ask for that. I wasn't, I didn't overpay. God did something because they were just as confused as me. But God did that. You got to remember. Now, some of you all are going, man, that's amazing. That's nothing like that's ever happened to me. Here's the thing. It doesn't always have to be something dramatic like that. Some of you all just need to remember when God had you show up at his own church one Sunday. Amen. And now you keep coming back and God is doing something in your life, bringing you, making your family stronger. Your faith is growing. Some of you just remember, you can just go back and remember, you just had a cold one day and then you got well. It could have been one day you were feeling down and out and somebody just texted you, hey man, thinking about you, praying for you. It could have been you heard a song that just encouraged you and lifted your spirits. You remember what God has done and who he is. He is a good God. So what do you do to climb out of the dip by faith? The first thing that we do is we remember. You have to remember. The second thing that you do is you accept. You accept. You accept what God is doing. This one is difficult. Because there are things in our lives that are happening to us, we don't want to accept it. You get a bad diagnosis from the doctor, I don't want to accept it. You get some bad news, I don't want to accept it. You got to show up for a double at work, I don't want to accept it. There's a lot of things that happen to us, we don't want to accept it. But here's the, here's the thing about it though. Accepting that what is happening to you is real is the way, one of the ways God will bring you out of the dip. Now, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we don't pray for a miracle. We still pray for miracles. We still believe God can do anything that's possible. But we also, we don't, we don't become hits Christians. Anybody ever heard of a hits Christian? A hit, H-I-T-S, a hits Christian. Let me tell you what a hits Christian is. A hits Christian is a head in the sand Christian. This is, this is what I mean. A hits Christian is you get a bad report from the doctor. Oh, you, uh, you've got this diagnosis. No, I don't. I don't have it. And you put your head in the sand. I don't use the deny, 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 deny. I don't have it. I don't have it. And I don't mean like you're believing by faith that you're going to be healed, but I mean like denying the reality of what's happening. A lot of followers of Jesus, unfortunately, we do that. We just deny. Nope, nope, nope. No, that that's not happening to me. No, no. That's not happening to me. Yes, it is happening. Now let's look to Jesus who can make it right. Amen. But there are a lot of followers of Jesus. They, they just We have this, this weird theology of like you get bad news and you just want to, no, I don't accept it. It's one thing to say, this is what's happening to me. But you know what, God, I'm coming to you. I believe that I am healed even though they say that I'm sick. Amen. But we don't deny things. We accept it. Weeks, we have to accept it. Here's what Habakkuk did. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 16. Habakkuk had to accept this. Remember, God is still sending judgment on them. This is happening. He don't understand it. It's not fair. And he go, no, you're not God. It's not happening. We're going to be free. Nothing's going to happen. No, it's going to happen. And here's what Habakkuk did. I trembled inside when I heard this. Why? Because he knew something was coming. What was happening was going to happen. There were consequences for our sin, Amen. ladies and gentlemen. There are. All of us. Some of our consequences, we won't have to feel them that much. There's other consequences, you don't have to feel them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You cheating on your spouse, they find out, you got to walk through some healing, that's real. You got to accept it. You got to accept what you did, and you got to walk through the healing process. And it's, you got to accept the consequences, Right? You steal something from somebody and you get caught. Guess what? You got to accept and face yeah. the consequences. Yeah. You can't deny. I didn't do it. Enough. No, you did it. Yeah. We got you on camera. That's you. Come on. That's you. You got to accept. So Habakkuk, let's go back to verse 16. Habakkuk understood. This is happening. My legs gave way beneath me and I shook in terror. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who invade us. He was like, this is coming. I don't understand why it's not to happen, but I'm going to face the fact that it is happening. But far too many of us, here's what happened. We don't want to accept things because we think we can, we know better than God and we can do it better than God. 
a few weeks ago, you were, almost every hand went up in here when y'all said, like, I think that if I were God, I would do things differently. Would you? Would you? Would you really, though? See, we say that from our own limited human perspective. You realize at, at most, let's say you're one of the few people, at most in all of history, you get 120 years that you could be alive here on Earth. You realize how long the Earth has been around? And you talking about 70, 80, 90, 100 years? That's your life. But yet we want to tell God, who has been around before all of this, I know better, I can do better, I got it figured out. If I were you, I would do things differently. Here, let me just... Let me just show you some facts. Because here's what Habakkuk knew. Habakkuk knew what many of us, we don't want to accept. God is sovereign. What does that mean? He is God. He's in control. We want to be in control of him, but you didn't create yourself. He created you. He understood this. That's why he was like, oh, my leg's shaking, I'm trembling. Because he understood God was in total control. Here's just a few facts for you. My wife shared these with me. These are from Louis Giglio. He has a book called Indescribable 100 Devotions About God and Science. Here's how much control God is in in your life. I just listen to this. Your DNA code is so wrong that if the DNA from one cell, not all of your cells, but one cell was stretched out, it would be six feet long. Now you tell me something. Could you do that? Do you have the, the mind and know how to do all of that? If we stretched out all of your DNA, think about all of it, all of your DNA, listen to this, three, 37.2 trillion cells in your DNA, trillion, not million, not billion, trillion. If we stretched them all out, we could go from here and the moon, not once, not twice, not a thousand times, but 150,000 times can your DNA go from the moon and back. Mm. Do you think that you can create something that intricate? Mm. But yet we think we know, God, I know better than you. I know better than you. But I don't understand my own DNA. <laughs> Just a couple more. There are 2,000 different types of starfish in the world. Most of them have five arms. But others have as many as 40. You never, I've never seen a starfish with 40 arms. The sunflower starfish is the largest kind of starfish. It has 24 arms and can grow as four, big as 40 inches. Have, have y'all heard of that before? Anybody? But yet we know better. We know more than God. You, come on now. Your eyes blink 12 times every minute. 12 times. That's 10,000 blinks every day. Each blink lasts about 0.3 seconds, which means you have closed your eyes more than 50 for more than 50 minutes every single day. This. But yet we want to tell God, I know more than you. I would do it differently than you. 2004. I'm going to share two more. Scientists discovered a planet called 55 Can Cancery E that's covered in diamonds and graphite. Anybody heard of this? Nobody? We know more than God, though. They estimate that the value will be 26.9 nanomillion. Nine millions. I've never heard of nine millions before. That's 269 followed by nine zeros. But it's too far to travel, and it's also 4,400 degrees Fahrenheit on that planet. But we know more than God. I'm sharing these facts with you to just to help you understand how vast and how wide God is infinite. But in our own lives, we want to tell God, we know more than you. I would do things differently than you. There was a, dude, there was a man named Job in the Bible. If you've never read that book, Amen. read it. He lost everything. And he asked God. And God answered him. God answered him with a whole list of things that men and women will never understand. In Job 38, verse 16, it says this, We and where light and darkness live, Job 38, 19, you keep reading all the way through that, he keeps telling them all the things that I've done. Why? Because he's sovereign. And we got to accept that he knows more than us, 
We don't understand what he's doing, why he's doing it, but he's doing it for a reason. And that reason is love. It's never for our downfall. It's never because God hates us. It's for our love. But we have to accept it. Amen. You got to accept it. You got to accept some things. There's some things that you're going to pray for. And God may not answer that thing when you want him to. Yeah. You have to accept it. God, I ask you to do this. But you haven't done it yet. I have to accept it. You don't deny it. You accept it. You remember what God has done and you accept what God is doing, even though we don't understand it. And here's the beauty and the power, because there's one more thing. We remember and we accept. The third thing that we do to climb out of the dip by faith is we trust. We trust in what God is going to do. Somebody say trust. trust. These last few verses of this chapter are so powerful. Here's what he says. Habakkuk says in chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. He says this. I know bad things are coming. And even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there were no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk has absolutely no reason to rejoice. What does God say he's going to do? I'm sending people more evil than you than you are to come get you. What does he say? It's coming. It's going to happen. And Habakkuk goes, that stinks. That's not fair. I don't like it. But Habakkuk comes to this place where he says, even though we may be in a famine, we may not have enough food to eat. Even though I might lose my job. Even though I got a diagnosis from the doctor. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Amen. He came to this place that even though all of these things were happening to him, he was going to trust in God. He was going to trust in God. Yet I will rejoice. Amen. This is the place that every follower of Christ, God wants you to get to. Every one of us. Every one of us will go through a time of wondering. What are you doing, God? Every one of us are going to go through a time of waiting. We don't see God. We don't feel God. We don't understand what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. But if you will stay with him, yes, if you will say, even though I don't understand, yet I will rejoice. Yet I will trust. Let me put it in, in, in ways you may understand it. Even though your spouse did not stick to their vows and they broke that covenant of marriage, yet you will rejoice in the Lord because God is able to do anything. He's a restorer and he can heal. Even though the doctor said you only have so much time to live, yet I will trust and rejoice in the Lord because God is a healer. There were these three Hebrew young men in the book of Daniel and they were uh, told, do not pray to your God. If you pray to your God, we're going to throw you in a fire. And they said, well, you're going to throw us in the fire because we are not going to, we have to pray to our God. And they were like, well, we're going to throw you in here right now. And they literally said these words. Even if, go ahead, throw us in here. Even if our God doesn't take care of us and bring us out of this fire, we still won't bow down to a foreign God. They had come to this place of, even though I don't get it, I'm still going to trust in God. Amen. But here's what I need you to know. You can't get to that place 
until you had a chapter one wondering and questioning. Yeah. If you've never questioned God before, you can never get to this place of, yet I will trust in him. Yeah. If you've never gone through a chapter two type of faith, where you're waiting and waiting and God's not doing anything, you can never get to chapter three where you will say, even though I'm still going to trust God. God wants every one of us to get to the place of even though. Somebody say even though. Even though. And you know what that even though is in your own life. For everybody is different. Even though that family member cut you off. Even though you may lost your job. Even though your finances aren't where you want them to be. God is still in control and he will bring you through. How do I know this? Because of the very next verse that Habakkuk tells us. Bring this down. He says this in verse 19. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as the deer, able to tread upon the heights. What does that mean? Habakkuk got to chapter 3 because he said, even though all of these things are happening, the Lord is my strength. What will he let me do? He will let me walk on new heights. Why? Because God is your strength. Even though all these things are happening, God will bring you to a new place. This is chapter 3. This is where God wants every single one of you to be. I know you're in the dip right now, but you can get here. Amen. Why? Because God is your strength. Yes. He is your strength. Yes, you're going to go through things. Jesus said this, you're going to go through many troubles. So here's what I need everybody to know. If you follow Jesus, trouble is coming your way. We can't go, oh my God, I didn't know I was going to get in trouble. I would have never get He know you are going to get in trouble. There's going to be trouble. You're going to go through trials. Yes. If you're not going through it, you should be going, what's wrong with me? Yeah. You shouldn't be, what's going on? Why me? No, if nothing is happening to you, you need to go, why me? Right. Because you're going to face trials. Yeah. But that's why Jesus came. And if you will stay with him in the wondering, in the waiting, he will bring you to a place where you are worshiping him no matter what. No matter what. And I'm here in some areas. Can I keep it a buck with you? I'm not there in all areas. And that's why I need Jesus. There's some areas I'm still, I'm still kind of holding on. I'm still like, I don't know God. But if you'll stay with him, I've been with God enough. Here's the thing. When you are with God long enough, you'll be able to say this. Can I keep it true? I couldn't say this when I first gave my life to Jesus. It, I couldn't. My, my faith wasn't mature enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I gave my life to Jesus, I hadn't been through anything. So there was no, yet will I trust God, because there was nothing I didn't trust God with yet, other than just save me. Some of you all, you're, you're like, I don't know if I can get to that chapter three type of faith just yet, Pastor. Well, guess what? If you're with Jesus long enough, your life, you'll go through a lot of these and the more of these you'll go through the more chapter 3 you'll have in your life the more chapter 3 here's what I here's what I know here's what I know I've walked with Jesus through enough yesterdays that I can trust him with tomorrow there's enough things that I can remember that I can trust him with tomorrow's I don't get it. And God wants every person in here to get there. That is my prayer for you watching online. That is my prayer for every person in here. That you get to this place where you've been with Jesus long enough that your yesterday, God brought me through that, he'll bring me through this. I don't understand why this is happening right now. I don't know why my family split up. I don't know why I have to go back and forth between parents' houses. I don't know why my finances aren't where they need to be. I don't know why these things are happening. When you've been through them enough, you get to this place where you'll say, God, I trust in you. I've been, there's, I told y'all last week, there's some prayers that we, my wife and I, we've been praying and believing for for so long. God hasn't done them yet, but we're in this place of 
we're not going anywhere. We're not walking away from God. We're going to trust him because we've seen him do something before. He'll do it again. So I want us to leave this series understanding this. Trouble is not an absence of God in your life. It's not. Questioning God isn't a bad thing. Many times questioning God can be a source of faith in your life. Waiting isn't a bad thing. Because many things in our lives that we have to wait for, we're so glad we waited for those things. And if you'll wait on God, he will renew your strength. And lastly, no matter what you're facing in your life, if you will come to this place that even though I'm facing troubles, even though I'm hurting, even though I feel like I won't ever come out, if I get to a place that I say, God is my strength, he will bring me to a new place of faith in him. That's Habakkuk. That's the book of Habakkuk Church. It's one of the realest books in the entire Bible. Because every single one of us can relate to what Habakkuk walked through. Here's what I want you to know. If you'll get to this place where you continue to embrace and wrestle with God, he will bring you to a new place of faith that you never thought you would ever be. So this next week, read chapter 3. Every single day, just read it. Remind yourself, even though, yet I will trust. Even though, God is my strength. Even though, he will bring me to a new place. I've talked to many of them. I know you're in the dip. God will bring you out. Stay with him. He's good. He is for you. Don't give up. Don't give in. You're so close. Many people walk away when they are on the break, the break of their breakthrough. That God is like, if you stay with me one more day, I'll bring you to a place that you never would have thought before. Don't give up. Don't give in. God is for you. So let's pray. God, help us to have an even though, yet will I type of faith. We know we're going to go through things. We know this is a tough season. But God, I pray that you will bring us out as we embrace and we wrestle with you. Can, can we be honest with every head bowed and every eye closed? There may be some of you all in here that if you right now, you're in the dip and you want to climb out of the dip and you want to get to this uh, uh, yet will I faith? Let me see your hands right now so I can see you here. So I can know who to be praying for. I see so many hands going up. Here's, here's what I want to do. I want to pray. God, I pray that you will help us. Every person that lifted their hands, my heart goes out to them. They are in the dip. God, I pray that we will be like Habakkuk, that we will remember your goodness, that we will remember your promises, that we will accept some of the things that we have been dealt with. But we will never let go of you. I pray that we will trust in you. That we will believe in you. That you are still on the throne. That we believe that all things are possible with you. Knowing you will reveal yourself to us when we never let you go. Those that are in the dip, God, they have questions. It's hard right now. But I pray that, God, that you will move them to a place of faith and move them to a place of worship. God, I pray that they'll be able to say that, God, I will worship you in the good and in the not so good. That I will remember your goodness. That I will accept that you're still on the throne. That, God, we thank you for who you are. Help us to remember your faithfulness. Bring our, those things to our remembrance. And, God, help us to be able to walk on new heights, new places of faith. You know what they're struggling with, but God, I pray that you will bring them out and through in Jesus' name. As we continue praying with every head bowed and every eye closer, there may be some of you all that are in here and we're talking about worshiping God. And if you are honest, you're like, I don't even know what that means. I don't know what worshiping God means. And, and, and here's, what, here's the thing about it is that those who have given their life to Jesus, when you know what God has done for you, there's nothing that you... you your, your only response is, I got to worship him. I got to worship him because he's been too good to me. But you may be thinking, well, there's nothing. You don't understand all the things that I've done. Like, there's no way that God will be good to me because I've done so much wrong. The truth is, God is good. He's so good and he loved you so much that he Boy, sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die for your sins. He became everything that you ever did. And he said, if you will surrender your life, meaning this, if you just call on his name, 
You don't have to like stop all of those bad habits, stop all of these things. He says, no, just come to me. Give me your life. Surrender to me and I will make you into a new person. Yeah. I will take away those desires. I will make you brand new. If you're here today and you're like, you know what, Pastor? I need a fresh start. I need to be made new. I want to give my life to Jesus. All you have to do is lift up your hand long enough for me to see you. Because when you call on his name, he gives you a fresh start and you start brand new with him. Is anybody here today? I know hands are up. There may be somebody that's online. Today is the day that you find hope, life, and peace in Jesus. So everybody, repeat after me because nobody prays alone. Say, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Thank you for sending Jesus, you for sending Jesus to, die for me. to die for me. I believe that I'm a sinner. I I'm a sinner. And I need Jesus as my Savior. As my Savior. God, forgive me of all my sins. Of all my sins. Make, me brand new. Make me brand new. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Jesus, of my life. I give you my heart. I give you my mind. I am your child. And help me now, Lord. To be with you in the questions, in the way, and bring me to a new place of faith in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate this morning, church.